Welcome to the DevOps Library. This is Samantha with Episode 10. We're glad you found yourself here. Today we're going to talk about writing high-quality, reusable PowerShell code. We're going to start by looking at a typical PowerShell script that we found in the wild. And by rewriting it, we'll cover how and why to write commandlets instead of scripts. We'll also cover a few advanced topics such as hash maps, splatting, and creating modules from scratch. Okay, let's get started. Here we have a short, typical PowerShell script we found on TechNet named checkfreediskspace.ps1. Before we examine it, let's just try to run it first. <sighs> okay, it's asking for credentials and we can't find a file named computers.txt on our D drive. While it wouldn't be that much work to revise a script for our own use, what if the script were more complex? By the time we figure out what needs to be changed, we may as well have started from scratch. Unfortunately, this type of code is what a lot of sysadmins end with before moving on to writing their next script. But if you follow along, we'll show you how to write code that's more useful for others to use, as well as yourself when you're trying to build off of old scripts. Okay, before we get started, let's do some organizing and create an area to store our future PowerShell modules. First, create and clone a repository. Our code should be in version control, as it allows for easily reverting when something breaks and simplifies sharing with the team. If you don't have a repository, we highly recommend setting one up for free on github.com. Inside of our repository, let's go ahead and create a new folder named Modules. This is where we'll store any PowerShell modules that we create. Okay, let's go ahead and create our first one. Make a new directory. We'll call ours DevOps Library. Okay, inside, add a file named devopslibrary.psm1. It's important that the name of this file matches the name of the folder, as PowerShell will automatically look for this file when we call import module. It only needs to contain the line seen here. It's a little trick we use that just dot sources every PS1 file within the same folder as the module. In other words, when we type import module DevOps library later on, PowerShell will load every function that we save with the extension PS1 in our modules folder. PowerShell will also look for an optional file with the extension psd1, known as the manifest. We won't worry about it in this episode as it's primarily used for adding supplemental information. Okay, we have one more thing that we need to do before rewriting the script. If we try to run import module, PowerShell isn't going to know where our module is located. By default, PowerShell looks for modules in two places, one under System32, Windows PowerShell, v1.0, modules, and the second under User Documents, Windows, PowerShell, Modules. While we could move our module, we'd prefer to keep it where it is so that our code is version controlled. We just need to add our modules folder path to the PS module path variable in system. Once we've done that, make sure that you close and reopen PowerShell. Okay, now we're finally ready to rewrite the script. Let's begin by renaming the file to something that fits in with the standard PowerShell convention of verb noun. To see a list of suggested verbs, just run get verb. Since our script is retrieving information on disk space, let's use get for the verb and disk space for the noun. So save the file as get disk space ps1 under our DevOps library module folder. All right, now let's go ahead and wrap the entire script under a function named get disk space. It's really important that you give the function the same name as the file name, otherwise it'll become difficult to locate your functions later on. All right, that looks slightly better, but we still do have two major problems. One is that the list of computer names is hard-coded, and second, the script requires user interaction because we're using get credential. Let's break those out of the script by turning them into parameters. Delete the clear line as well. You should never use anything like clear or write host, as they make it frustrating for someone trying to reuse your code. Instead, use commands like write verbose or write debug for testing. Let's go ahead and delete the file get content line as well. That line currently forces anyone that uses our script to supply a list of servers as text file. That really doesn't make any sense because they might want to pipe a list of host names or pass them in as an array. You really should always write your code to be as concise, flexible, and simple as possible. 
we'll also replace the for each with our own shorthand version. If you haven't seen the pipe percent combination before, it's the same as saying for each, but instead of each item having a name, we reference them using dollar underscore. In our example, that means for every host name in the variable server name, do get WMI object with the host name being referenced by dollar underscore. Speaking of get WMI object, discard everything after the pipe as well. All of that formatting is useless. While it may look more pleasing when the command is run by hand, it's really about the worst thing we could do for reusability. Let's say someone else utilizes our script and wants to divide the returned number. Do you think it's easier to divide 500 or 500 MB? So remember to always separate logic from presentation. Okay, so before we go too much further, let's make our function a real commandlet. Add commandlet binding to the top of our function. Then move our parameters out of the function signature to right after our commandlet binding call. What is this black magic, you're probably asking? Well, it tells PowerShell that this is a real commandlet, which gives us many benefits. One of those benefits is advanced parameters, allowing us to create different sets of parameters, make some mandatory or optional, use cool commands like write verbose and write debug, as well as a couple of other tricks, including easy documentation. Oh yes, speaking of documentation, that's something we recommend writing before you code a script, not after. If we clearly outline what our function is going to do, what parameters it's going to take, and possibly even include an example or two, it'll be easier for us to stay focused on what our code should be doing. All right, let's go ahead and write our documentation now. So, at the top of the function, we're going to add a comment block formatted in a special way so that PowerShell recognizes it. By using five special keywords, dot synopsis, dot description, dot parameter, dot example, and dot notes, we can add meaningful documentation to our commandlet. Yes, this really does take a little extra time, but the time it saves you and your team is more than worth it, not to mention the benefits of planning what you code. Okay, let's start with the synopsis. Get disk space doesn't imply what it returns. So let's say that the function will return the total amount of disk space and optionally the amount free or percentage free. Now onto the description. The description can just be a slightly more in-depth description of the synopsis. Let's also mention that the user can optionally pass in a set of credentials for running the command on a list of remote servers. We'll actually make it optional later on. For the parameters, just type the name of each parameter and on the next line just quickly describe what the parameter is used for. We're going to go ahead and type two examples as well. One showing how to use our get disk space command by piping a list of servers to it, as well as how to just return the percent of disk space free on the local server. If you're not ready to write the example documentation until you finish the script, that's completely okay, but please remember to come back to it. Okay, last but not least, we can add some notes. Notes can be anything that you'd like, really. Some people like to add the author of the script here, or maybe even just some helpful information for the user. An important point to remember is that once you have documented the parameters of a function and what it should return, you should stick with them once the code has been shared. The reason for this is because you, or anyone else on your team, may now be depending on your function. That doesn't mean you can't improve the code or change how the commandlet does something, but everyone should be able to count on the parameters and what is returned to remain the same. Does that make sense? Okay, well, at least we're finally done with our documentation. Do you want to see something neat now? Hit F5 to run our partially completed commandlet. Nothing happened, of course, as everything is wrapped in a function, which is exactly what we wanted. Now type get help get disk space. See, it was worth it. Look at how nice that looks. Now when someone tries to use our code, instead of having to open up the script and look at it, they can just type get help to see exactly how to use our commandlet. Great job, it looks good. Okay, we still have quite a bit left to do before we're finished. Let's try some of our new advanced parameter tricks. First, let's make it so that our function can be used in the pipeline. Why is it important to be able to pipe to our function? Because right now, to use our command, someone would have to type get disk space, server name, host name but they should also be able to use our command by typing an array of host names, pipe, 
get disk space. While that doesn't work yet, it's easy to implement. All we would need to do is add a special option called value from pipeline true in front of our server name parameter. Let's go ahead and do that now. We can also make any one of the parameters mandatory if we'd like by adding mandatory true, but we don't need to do that for this script. All right, let's add three more parameters, one named free, one named total, and one named percent. In front of each of these, add switch. Switch turns parameters into special Boolean switches. That way we can call get disk space dash free, for example, to return the amount of disk space available. Before we actually implement those switches, let's create an array right before the for each loop. Now add array plus equals in front of our get WMI object call. Now at the end of our script, we'll return the array. Make sure every function that you write returns something, even if it's just a true for success. If you haven't run the script for a little while, now might be a good time to look at it again to see our current output. First type dollar sign credentials, get credential, and fill in some credentials for a remote server. Then type get disk space dash ps credential credential dash server name, followed by the IP of the server. Your output should look similar to ours, and as you can see, we already have the necessary information to implement the switches for total space, free space, and percent. Let's edit our script right before the return array at the end. We're going to use a switch instead of a bunch of ugly if statements, and we'll use a variable named psboundparameters.keys. This magical little variable actually provides a list of all of the parameters that have been set when the function is called. It's extremely helpful, especially for what we're about to do. The code for our free, total, and percent switches will all look nearly identical. They consist of iterating through our array and returning a new array with the specific values we care about. Percent is a little unique in that we divide the amount of free space by the total size of the disk. Feel free to pause briefly to examine how our code is doing the work here. All right. I know this has been a long tutorial so far, but we're still going to introduce one final concept quickly before concluding the video, and that concept is called splatting. Splatting is really just a technique for providing parameters to function by using a hash table instead of outright specifying them. Why would we want to use splatting in this function? Well, because earlier we decided that specifying credentials or the server name should be optional. Right now, if you call get disk space without any parameters, the command will fail. We could solve that by making a few ugly sets of if statements like if credentials are supplied, call get WMI object with credentials, else call it without credentials, and so on, but it would look messy. So instead, we're going to use splat. Let's look at our current get WMI object call. What parameters are we going to call no matter what is supplied? Well, for our function, we're always going to want to specify the class as win32 logical disk and we always want the filter to be set as drive type 3. So let's create a hash table containing these values before our for each. Type parms equal at brace class equal win32 logical disk filter equal drive type 3 close brace. If you're not used to PowerShell hash maps, Go ahead and run this line, then type parms to look at the object. Just think of hash maps as an array of keys that are mapped to values. All right, on the line right after we set up the hash map, add the following line. This line is fairly simple. It's really just saying if someone runs this command with the ps credential variable set, then add it to our parameter hash map. Now we're going to add a relatively similar line at the top of our for each. Go ahead and add this. This line just says that if the name of the server is set, then we want to add the computer name parameter to our hash map along with the name of the server. We have to have it in for the for each loop because we want this to work even if the person running it supplies a list of servers. Now to finally apply the splatting completely remove all the parameters currently attached to get WMI object 
and replace them with at parms. You may be thinking, why an at sign? Don't we need a dollar sign? No, when calling a function, the at sign actually tells PowerShell to splat the variables. Trust us. Okay, believe it or not, our script is finally finished. Great job. Go ahead and commit the code to your repository. That way everyone else on the team can use it. Now how do we call it? Go ahead and close out a PowerShell ISE and just open a fresh PowerShell window for the demonstration. Type import module DevOps library, then hit enter. All right, our module has now been imported. Now type get help, get disk space to see our beautiful documentation again. You can now call the function any way that you'd like. You can do get disk space dash percent to return the percentage free of our local machine or pipe in a list of servers if you'd like. Our script went from being difficult to use to completely reusable. If we want to add more functions to our PowerShell module, just save each function as function name ps1 in your modules directory. Your team is going to love being able to just call import module to reuse your code. And if this video helped you, please feel free to send it to any of your teammates or friends as well. As usual, thanks so much for watching, and please leave any questions, comments, or thoughts in the comment section. Take care for now. Bye-bye.